Almost a century after a Tennessee court found John Scopes guilty of teaching evolution, the nation remains polarized over the roles of evolution and creation in public school science classes. The courts release Scopes on a technicality, but school boards and national forums continue to fire volleys. Evolution theory gained momentum in the ensuing decades, but so have the proponents of creationism. No longer touted as an article of faith, creationism and its weaker form intelligent design compete in the public arena to be recognized as bona fide science. To atheists, theories of intelligent design do little more than camouflage irrational belief in magical thinking. To the Christian right, intelligent design reaffirms the existence of God and the literal truth of scriptures. Scientists who criticize intelligent design face a major obstacle. The language used to describe evolution is not only riddled with design metaphors, design drives its basic narrative. Those metaphors suggest to evangelical and fundamentalist Christians that evolution theory merely masks the truth behind religious faith. If nature behaves with a purpose, doesn't that confirm the existence of a designer who gives it purpose? Darwin developed his theory of evolution from a husbandry metaphor. Animal and plant breeders improve the line by selecting and breeding the most desirable offspring and rejecting all others. Notice that the metaphor desirable lies at the heart of the story's structure. In Darwin's new story, nature selects those attributes that best serve the survival of a species and help it adapt to new circumstances and new information. As the story developed over time, some individuals will perform better than others, making them fitter. So selection can push the population upward to better or higher levels. Nature selects through adaptation and sexual competition. Some versions such as Ronald Fisher's, sea selection is a gradual process nudging or guiding species toward adaptation. Selection weeds out less desirable characteristics and favors the better. Others, such as Stephen Gould, describe the process as violent, explosive, and even lucky, with new characteristics suddenly appearing to change the overall characteristics of the population. Additional evolution metaphors include self-organization, problem-solving, junk DNA, selfish genes, genetic algorithms, molecular mechanisms, regulatory functions, structural order, genetic code, genetic information. The debate involves more than matters of linguistic taste. There are a number of reasons scientists are concerned. Two of those reasons concern us here. One of the cornerstone arguments for distinguishing statements about God from scientific language is the embedding of metaphors in religious thought. Metaphors can neither be proved nor disproved, making them essentially meaningless. The metaphorical nature of religious language became the foundation of Anthony Flew's falsification argument. To be scientific, a statement must have conditions under which it can be empirically disproved. There is no religious statement which also has conditions religious thinkers would accept as evidence of disproof, primarily because they are metaphorical. For example, God loves his children. God clothes the pastures in his glory. Therefore, metaphoric and by extension religious statements are scientifically meaningless. Clearly, the falsification argument affects evolutionary claims. Under what condition can we disprove the phrase, nature selects, or that selection nudges and guides species, or that genes are selfish and selected strands of DNA are junk? Scientists answer that the statements aren't literal, but metaphorical expressions of adaptation. This response is circuitous. In the absence of specific, falsifiable, Non-metaphoric statements, the language of evolution would have little more meaning than the statement, God loves us. Because science is empirical, scientists want to avoid questions of good, bad, better, worse. But natural selection implies design and value. Species adapt to improve chances of survival. Adaptations make species better suited to survive. Scientists try to distance themselves from the appearance of value by claiming that some adaptations aren't optimal and different adaptations could have better served the species. Unfortunately, to claim that a species could have developed better adaptations remains a value judgment as well. Nor could we imagine what test could be constructed to prove empirically that a different version of the eye would perform better for a species' needs. Even assertions of adaptation as optimal, efficient, and beneficial raise questions of value. It's easy for scientists to disconnect the metaphors of design from belief in an actual designer.
This doesn't mean it's possible to persuade non-scientific thinkers that design metaphors are useful for explanation, but not necessarily true. Especially when we present them with a theory that challenges their most fundamental beliefs. To suggest that we can simply remove the metaphors from evolutionary theory overlooks how the brain develops or evolves concepts. Without metaphors, we might not be able to conceptualize at all, including evolution. According to linguist Guy Deutscher, even in the most commonplace discourse, it's hardly possible to venture a few steps without treading on dozens of metaphors. For metaphors are everywhere, not only in language, but also in our mind. Metaphor is the chief mechanism through which we can describe and even grasp abstraction. Even the evolution of consciousness is tied to metaphoric thought. The mind expands awareness by extending our interactions with our immediate environment into a larger world. According to Deutscher, the mind cannot simply manufacture words for abstract concepts out of thin air. All it can do is adapt what is already available. And what's at hand are simple physical concepts, objects one can point at, like head or tree, and physical actions, like cut and run. Consider the following hypothetical construction of metaphoric bridges, beginning with body sensations of comfort and discomfort, pleasure and pain, essence and attribute. This object is always pleasurable or painful when I encounter it. Its essence is pleasurable. Pain is an attribute. Cause and effect. I feel pain or pleasure when I do this. My actions cause pain. Pain is an effect of what I do. Function. This attribute or behavior contributes to a desired state. Desirability must be its function. This attribute allows me to perform a task. The ability to perform this task must be its function. Purpose. I can't achieve a goal without this activity or possession. Achieving the goal must be its purpose. Value. I want to avoid pain and experience pleasure. Pain is bad, and pleasure is good. As our minds develop more sophisticated metaphoric bridges, it's only natural that they evolve into more complex organizing forms, combining language, image, and even structure. Metaphoric stories don't have to be fleshed out or even verbalized for the mind to use them to organize and interpret our experience. A metaphoric story that developed within the last few centuries is the mind is a machine. The machine mind story might be verbalized as, the mind machine gathers data from the world, processes it, and creates thought as a product when its task is finished. For example, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby of the Center for Evolutionary Biology claim, evolutionary psychology is based on the recognition that the human brain consists of a large collection of computational devices that evolved to solve the adaptive problems regularly encountered by our hunter-gatherer ancestors, including programs whose designs constitute a precise definition of human nature. Metaphors included in the computer story of the brain include evolved architecture, emotion programs, reasoning procedures, interpretation systems, circuit mapping, domains, goals. This, according to Jacob Bernowski, is where the path from metaphor to algorithm always goes. When Newton saw the moon as a ball that had been thrown around the earth as he formulated his notions of force, he was initiating a gigantic metaphor. And when it finished up, it was an algorithm. And that is the path from metaphor to algorithm that every scientific theory has to follow. We unconsciously treat the story as real because it answers questions and allows us to describe thoughts and brain as artifacts encountered in our collective experience. Unfortunately for scientists who want to remove teleology from evolution, the mind as a machine metaphor reinforces the notion that nature is an artifact. The artifact aspect interferes with people's ability to accept a mind or evolution without a designer. Even the metaphor order, which is embedded in almost every scientific theory, creates a roadblock to separating concept from metaphor. Order implies purpose by any definition. Additional metaphors, frequently invoked by scientists writing about physics in the universe, include force, pressure, attraction, repulsion, work, charm, resistance, mechanism, structure, universal law, or law of nature. Although the theory of evolution seeks to remove a creator from our explanation of nature, it seems the language to describe nature makes a creator far more difficult to dismiss, if not for scientists, then for their increasingly hostile adversaries. 
If we look through the history of Western thought, we can unravel the metaphoric threads that still support scientific thought and the public understanding of science. In Neolithic societies, survival depended on hospitable surroundings. Any climate changes could force migration or starvation. Metaphors based on nature is conscious explained what appeared to be capricious and arbitrary conditions. Early metaphors were no doubt totemistic, but with time, conscious nature evolved into a force who could be appealed to and appeased. Conscious nature became nature is a person, which evolved into divine person. As agriculture and city-states provided stability and security, people with leisure could speculate about cause and substance. People could control some elements of nature, rather than being under its control. Early Greek philosophers turned from supernatural cosmology to natural cosmology, and to describe the world metaphorically through known substances. Earth, fire, air, and water. This marks a shift away from divine agency, even if the early Greeks wouldn't have seen it that way. Aristotle makes another shift by adding the notion of force, or natural agency. The net effect was to create two new metaphors. The world is material, and material has essence. More importantly, the metaphor, the world is material, allowed later philosophers to form yet a new metaphor. Cause is material. Darwin's theory emerged as scientists began to separate science from the divine altogether. Arguments to design and final cause permeated Western thought and suggested that life, human life, could only be explained by God's hand in the universe. Darwin wasn't the only scientist who, even though he believed in God at the time, wanted to remove supernatural intervention from the workings of nature. Among the responses to the language of design in current scientific debate, we can isolate three distinct threads. Some, such as Stephen Gould, would replace design metaphors with technical labels. For instance, exaptation instead of function. Exaptation suggests that function is incidental to adaptation. Turtles who dig sand with flippers to bury eggs need not have developed the flippers to dig sand. They simply do so. Whether or not an exaptation can be satisfactorily explained as functional or incidental remains a linguistic and not a scientific debate. The real question, which hasn't been answered to everyone's satisfaction, is whether or not exaptation can be explained and illustrated without referring back to the same metaphoric language it's trying to replace. Other scientists suggest we merely ignore the metaphors and embrace the concept behind them. This begs the question. Is suspending metaphors even possible, especially in the minds of religious thinkers and lay people? To suggest the absence of a designing God is different from suggesting that metaphors for design don't actually imply design. Could lay readers be trained to distance metaphor from concept? Possibly, if we train them to think as scientists. But policymakers and advocates aren't trained as scientists. This is why we face the dilemma of science in public education. To ask them to train themselves as scientists is no more reasonable than to ask scientists to train themselves in religious and political thought. In the meantime, we are left with a third position of Ruse and others, who accept that design and evolution can't be separated. It should pose no problem to studying and explaining evolution. While this is not a problem for teaching science in the classroom itself, we are left with the question, can science be taught without alienating religious belief in the public arena? The theory of evolution eliminates the need for a god to explain the workings of the universe. This doesn't mean it disproves his existence altogether. Any statements about God fail the basic test of falsifiability. Just as there is no empirical test which a believer might accept to disprove the statement God exists, there is no empirical test which a skeptic might accept to disprove the statement God does not exist. For scientists, to publicly accept these distinctions would allow them to press the case that both creationism and intelligent design are philosophical questions and not scientific theories. I would make the claim that they're little more than chimeras, cobbled together from theological and philosophical arguments, questions of probability, and a few empirical observations carefully selected to support their conclusions. Scientists are quite right to suggest a theory of design doesn't belong in science classes. Whether or not creationism and intelligent design belong elsewhere in the curriculum is a different question, a question that scientists can speak to as concerned parents and citizens, but not with the authority of science. So long as scientists stake out this equally unscientific claim, they expose themselves to open warfare from the Christian right. I'm sure the right will continue to declare war on science, but redefining the debate will go a long way towards disarming them.